Good evening. Welcome to the Glazoff Gang. And this will be the best Glazoff Gang yet. Tonight, we have three titans with us. Michael Walsh, an author and screenwriter who has six critically acclaimed novels as well as a hit TV movie. He is a major literary award winner, has two New York Times bestsellers, and he is the co-writer of the Disney Channel's then highest rated show, Cadet Kelly. And Michael, I guess I should have just called you a renaissance man, right? I guess, I don't know, it's up to you, Jay. Our next guest, Josh Brewster, intellectual. And Shant Kondarian, the author of A Thousand and One Nights in Iraq, the shocking story of an American forced to fight for Saddam against the country he loves. He experienced a 10-year ordeal of entrapment due to Desert Storm and the Iran-Iraq War, and he is here to tell us his story. Gentlemen, welcome to the Glasoff Gang. Good to be here. Yeah. Thank you. On a scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you to be on the Glasoff Gang, Michael? I'm fired up. I'm at an 8 and, and go heading north. 8? Okay. Yeah, heading north. Josh? I'm, I'm, I'm at a seven, a nice, comfortable seven right now, but I'm, I'm going north, too, with a bullet. Shant? I'll give you a ten. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. And now, before we go further, Shant is not a member of the Glasoff gang before the show, so he's a new member. Michael and Josh, please tell him the rule about the Glasoff gang. There's a rule about <laughs> okay, the yeah. Okay, oh. I've been doing this for a year and a half now. You can you check. check out, but you can never leave. Excellent. Uh, Thank you so you much. Go. Okay. And who sang the song? Uh, that's the uh, Eagles. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So, and you're my comfortable with that rule? Oh, yeah. And it's your favorite song? It's my favorite song. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. From the, jo from the world of jokes and buffoonery to the serious issues of our time, Shant, what an incredible story you have to tell. Why don't you just start your way? It's a, it's, it's a strange story. And uh, I think it's a story of modern times where boundaries between countries have dissolved and uh, travel has become transparent. Uh, I am Armenian, born in Iraq, became a permanent resident in the United States. I decide to visit my country one day and the Iran-Iraq war start, starts, get trapped for 10 years. You're there in 1980, 1979? 1980 okay. to 1991. So you're just visiting? Yes. Iran-Iraq war starts. They close the border and I can't return. And I end up serving in the military during that war. I served again during Desert Storm. And my whole family is here. My father used to be there, but he, from the first year, he died in a car accident. And so things became just gradually worse. And uh, at some point during Desert Storm, I decided to volunteer on the first boat, hoping to be captured by the Americans. It was like a suicide mission. Our job was to navigate through an Iraqi minefield both ways while the Americans are going to try to bomb us from the sky. Wow. And so uh, my boat sank, my rescue boat sank as well, and uh, the Americans picked us up from the water. I was one of the first POWs that they captured. And I thought that this was salvation, but unfortunately my multinational status, and I speak languages, Armenian, Arabic, English, I was studying German and Russian at the time, and, and I had a belt. Vy govoríte parusky? Ja govorím parusky. Ochin frikrasno. Okay, but sorry, continue. And so, uh, and I also had a backpack with some books. They happened to be nuclear physics and quantum theory books. I'm an engineer by training, and so that kind of freaked them out. And uh, they, uh, they kept me uh, uh, in isolation. I was interrogated constantly. They thought I was a spy or something. And I didn't mind it because They I, thought you were for Saddam. Yes. Okay. And so I was in solitary like confinement conditions, uh, blindfolded, handcuffed for a whole month and, and, and escorted even to the bathroom, interrogated every day. And finally they started to believe in my strange story and they started to help me. And at some point they did bring me back to the United States. Goodness so, gracious. Now these yeah. are Americans, right? Yes. And now there was something, you had a love affair with an... There was some of that, yeah. Uh, oh, my, can I ask? Yes. There was a female American interrogator? And she's a guard. She was a guard? Yes. And you developed a relationship? Yes. Uh, during a period of my stay, uh, we did fall in love with each other, and uh, uh, nothing much happened in POW camps. You can't go out dating and do stuff. I but can imagine. We, we snuck some kisses and hugs, and, and then uh, we tried to reconnect here in the United States, and... 
What an incredible story. Before we go to our other two guests, what's one, one thing you would like to say about the whole experience? It's a human experience. You know, I would like people to look at what's happening in Iraq and think that these at the base are people like us and, and they would like to provide for their families and live a comfortable mm. life. But it's chaotic right now. But the Americans overall treated you very well. Wonderful. I'm still friends with them. I still have uh, reunions with them. Wow. In including one of my interrogators. He would come to Los Angeles and spend the night at my house. An incredible story. Josh, what are some of yeah, your thoughts Sha on this Sha story? I want to understand, you had the misfortune of visiting uh, at the exact wrong time. Exactly. And, and then later on, you're, you're captured. You're talking now in Desert Storm, right? This yes. is the second war. You were in the Iran-Iraq war. Yes. Uh, you, we were entrapped there. Yeah. And so you have this personal hell where you, you know, this timing must have, it must have driven you nuts just to think of all the possibilities of why didn't I plan this earlier or why didn't I plan this later. You must have gone through a, a trial internally for years. It was uh, traumatic, yes. And I had to deal with it. And I had to convince myself that these things happen, and they do happen to some people, and I happen to be one of these people. And therefore, they were normal. And then, so the only, I have one other question real quick. So when, you are, are, um, when you're captured, your boat sinks. Like you said, it was a suicide yes. mission. You, you hoped that that would be the outcome. How long did it take? I mean, you, you were here in America. You speak perfect English. How long did it take before you could reach the Americans and really get them to understand that what had happened to you. How long a process was that? I think there was a split. The, the soldiers that dealt with me, they com immediately were compassionate and they were trying to help. But then there was the bureaucracy and the red tape and the higher levels that were very suspicious of the whole situation. At, it took about three months when finally the embassy sent for me because they, wanted, they said they wanted to meet me just to know if I was a real person or just some myth because the story was just too, too weird. Wow. Let's move on. Michael, what do you make of it? Uh, well, I was going to ask Shant, uh, you're an ethnic Armenian. You're born in Iraq. You speak Arabic. You speak Armenian, presumably, yes. as well. English, uh, Fr uh, German, you mentioned Russian. Uh, you've lived in a lot of different places. You're now an American citizen. What do you feel yourself to be in a time of great sort of ethnic boxes that we tend to put people in in America? How would you describe yourself? You know, my whole life I felt I was outside the box. I grew up as an Armenian Christian, Orthodox Christian in, in an Arab Muslim country. Uh, I always went to the Armenian school, to the Armenian church. I came to the United States. I, I was still the outsider. And so it, it took me maybe 30 years before I accepted myself as this international status. That is really not just me. This is the, the, the times, you know that when I say that the boundaries between countries have dissolved, travel has become easier with the cell phone, with the internet, all these boundaries dissolve. Yes. And I think, it, it, you know, in the past, it was maybe a little more uh, strange to go to war and find your high school buddy on the opposite side of the war. But it happened to me, you know. Uh, it, it's just the times are different. And now, in a but sense, though, you're an American. I mean, I you're, American. You, it's the great thing about this country. And we, Jamie's born in Russia, grew up in Canada. And who knows where Josh is from? Uh, yeah, Buffalo. Uh, I'm an Irish American and with uh, you know family back in Ireland, and yet that's what makes us Americans is that we can all come together so so easily. And thank you, Michael. And gentlemen, speaking of Iraq, let's discuss Iraq. March this month, 2013, 10-year anniversary since the quote-unquote liberation invasion of Iraq by Bush. Well, I, I'd like to ask Sean real quick about Iraq. What, um, what do you think people need to know about Saddam Hussein? I mean, you know quite a bit about Saddam yes. Hussein's practices. When you stop and think about the American war in Iraq, et cetera, what, what do you think about with regard to Saddam Hussein? Now, one sec, one second. Please put that into your answer. But overall, from all three of you, what I want this to be about is uh, this 10-year anniversary. And when we look back, was it a mistake to go in? I think the American media ignored a lot of the good things that happened in Iraq. At the same time, this problem of nation building in a Muslim country, which yeah. some would say quicksand, and incorporating what Josh is also saying about Saddam Hussein. Your thoughts on the Iraq war 10 years later? When we decided to go into Iraq, I was happy. Who's we? America. Oh, okay. So George Bush. that kind of answers Michael's yeah. question. You yeah. consider yourself yes. an American. Okay. And so when we decided to go into Iraq, I was happy that somebody decided to take out Saddam Hussein because the Iraqi people have been trying year after year and they could not do it themselves. 
but it wasn't for any of the reasons that we said that we were going to go. I did not believe these reasons. And, and, and our government still have not, has not convinced me that these reasons were valid. But I was happy that they were going to take Saddam Hussein out. The thing for humanitarian about, reasons. For humanitarian they reasons. They liberated 25 million Muslims, yes. right? The thing about Saddam is that with the Iraqis, you know, they have a saying is that when you remove the lid from a septic tank and, and the stench comes out, you can't push it back in anymore. Yeah. And Saddam Hussein was that lid. Yeah. You know, they removed the lid and chaos came out. But look, Saddam Hussein did have weapons of mass destruction and he used them on his own people. And yes. at that time, there was a terrible fear that he was going to put those weapons into the hands of the people that perpetrated 9-11 or, or their ilk. And, uh, you know, I think it's just a very complicated... Well, how do you look back no. at the Iraq war? Well, well, one thing I, I want to know is, if, as a person who saw Saddam Hussein's regime up close and personal, yes. uh, are there things that Americans have yet to understand about the gravity of his practices, who he was, what he meant? Uh, you, know, you know, are Americans really clear, even aside from whether even Bush went in there or not, do Americans understand what this man was about? I mean, when we... Uh, when we um, Talk about, uh, we had some people torture, we, we practiced, some people practiced torture in our military. Do you know how this pales in comparison to what Saddam Hussein was doing to people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do yeah. Americans get this, Shant? I think they can, they can hear about it, but they'll never understand it fully. Because I've tried, I've, I've talked to people. In a setting like this, one of us or two of us would be agents for Saddam Hussein. In any setting, in any group, in any gathering, there would be agents. But, and yeah. another big problem yeah. is the American media, full of the left, full of liberals, that's focusing on American sins rather than on the monstrosities yeah, and, of Saddam and Hussein. And conflating American yeah. sins to make them look relative to the, the sins of, of, a, of a man. Yes. Yes. John, ten, uh, 10 seconds, please. Your own views on the Iraq war. Well, I thought that it was justified, and I thought that the Democrats went along with it, and then they threw Bush under the yes. bus. Uh, I am suspicious For of some of the reasons, reasons that we went right? in. But at the same time, I do believe that you have to target the people at the top of some of these regimes. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're caught between benevolent dictatorship and the Muslim Brotherhood, kind mm -hmm. of like what Noni says in her book. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there are times when you have to topple the figurehead. Okay, Michael? Uh, I think the question still remains on this 10th anniversary. Did we go into the right country? Uh, you can almost separate the two issues. Was Saddam a beast and a horrible monster and treated his own people terribly? Yes. Did that... Uh, necessitate the Americans going in and fixing that since Assad is a beast and is, you, you, you don't run out of beasts very quickly in the Middle or East. Or even Iran. Uh, Iran's got a whole other set mm -hmm. of problems when in fact we were attacked by mostly Saudi Arabia and it seems like we went out of the way not to attack the one country <laughs> that actually had attacked us mm -hmm. and I think that was a real problem and Bush could never make the PR case mm -hmm. that uh, we're kind of revenging 9-11, but we're kind of also liberating. And he, they never got their story straight. I think it cost them terribly in the political it, sphere. It, now, gentlemen, how when we look into the future here, you know, I'm confused about this myself because, you know, I believe, you know, I love America. I want to see it win, et cetera, et cetera. But staying in Muslim countries where the majority of people believe in Sharia, this is a problem that nation building can be quicksand. Do we just, for instance, get out? But if we get out, we could let Iraq fall into the sphere of the Iranians. Very briefly, is Obama making a mistake by withdrawing or his supposed withdrawal? How do you see things unfolding? Yeah. Did America win this war? Or if Iraq ends up in, Ira in, in Iranian hands, was it a waste of li lives and treasure? Iraq is not going to fall in Iranian hands. No? No. Uh, Obama may be pulling out a little too soon. I mean, we entered, we created the situation. We have to, you know, we, we can't solve one mistake by another mistake. Uh, what's happening in Iraq is not the fault of the Americans. But, you know, I, I think uh, you know my view is that this chaos was going to happen post Saddam Hussein, no matter who triggers that response. The Americans happened to remove Saddam Hussein. But if Saddam Hussein had died of natural yeah. causes, this chaos was going to happen. But, Sean, overall, looking back, you support Bush removing Hussein. Yes, I right? do. 
Josh, very briefly, well, please, because we've come to well, the end. Okay, well, well, here's the thing. You complicate matters when you're forking over $1.5 billion, then another $250 million to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. You're, you're creating all kinds of uh, moral inconsistencies and selective practices. And I think that it's, it, it's long since time, especially with all the blood that's been spilled, it's long since time for a serious effort to ask these countries to reject the idea of jihad. These countries have to reject the idea of jihad. And that's wishful thinking. But as long as that's wishful thinking, I don't think we'll ever have real clarity there. But this is the problem. Do we stay and waste American lives and treasure when, no. the, when the majority of the people believe in Sharia? I, I, I just, I'm very skeptical about Sharansky's thesis that all people want freedom. Well, I don't right? think that's true Michael, at all. Uh, yeah. I, I think that the real problem is going to be, did we win the war in Iraq? Yes and no. Yes, more or less. Can we lose the peace? Easily. Uh, Afghanistan was a complete disaster, uh, and we're pulling out with no prospect of victory. I want to get to that in our second segment, but, uh, but go uh, ahead. But I think that's the problem that politically the Republicans have had. They didn't make the proper arguments for those wars, and Obama is Teflon. He, none of this sticks to him. He can pull out, and Afghanistan can collapse tomorrow, and he'll say it's Bush's fault. But with the right has not made the... That has not sold the case to the American. If I could just be very simplistic, two seconds each. Yeah. Uh, looking back, support or oppose the invasion? Support? Support. I don't know. Yeah. We'll be back for our second segment of the Glasoff Gang.